All right, we're going to go ahead and get started since we're about two minutes past the hour and we have a lot of ground to cover in just 60 minutes. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, this is our webinar on recent and anticipated trends in ITAR and export controls enforcement. Very excited to be here with you today. Uh, we can move the slides forward. Um, just a couple of quick words of introduction and then we will jump right in. Uh, so for those I don't know, I am Brian Fleming. I am a member at the firm. I'm, along with Tim, one of the co-heads of our Economic Sanctions and Export Controls practice group. And prior to joining the firm, uh, I was at DOJ's National Security Division. So looking forward to uh, discussing what some of my old colleagues have been up to later in today's program. And I'll turn to Tim. Tim, you're on mute. Got it. That's a good way to start. Um, hi, everybody. It's good to see some friendly faces out there. I'm Tim O'Toole. I'm I, with Brian. I'm the co-head of our export controls and sanctions practice. And we're looking forward to talk to you about some enforcement trends today. And I'll turn it over to Chris to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Chris Stagg. I'm a counsel at the firm. And previously, I was at the Directorate, Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, where I was involved in revising the ITAR, the combined jurisdiction process, and working with the FBI on national security investigations. Thanks, Chris. All right, we can go forward. All right, so the, today's agenda, uh, we are going to run through uh, trends, uh, recent cases, compliance considerations, and uh, our general impressions of what is happening at the agencies. We're gonna start with DDTC, run through BIS, and then end with DOJ. Obviously, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, I think, thematic overlap and actual overlap in terms of some of the matters we talk about, but uh, that's how we've kind of organized things for today. Um, and then we're gonna wrap things up at the end with a few special situations, including uh, directed filings, disclosure issues, multi-agency disclosure issues and the like, things that sort of uh, uh, sort of up the ladder in terms of uh, complexity that we all have to deal with uh, from time to time. Um, we would encourage you all to submit questions via the chat function during the program today. We'll keep an eye on that and we will try to address those as we go. If we don't have a chance to squeeze them as we go, we will try to get to them at the end. Um, and like I said, we have we have sort of a lot to cover. There's a lot going on. Um, we're very excited to jump into it. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it to Chris to get us started. Okay, starting with uh, ITAR enforcement by the State Department's Directorate of Defense Trade Controls. Uh, we're gonna take a few minutes just to discuss uh, the process that they use to evaluate when to uh, take action and proceed with a consent agreement. Um, as I'm sure uh, most people are aware, every government agency has its own personality and DDTC is no different. And their personality in the export control enforcement world is a little bit different than their friends at the Department of Commerce and their enforcement of the export administration regulations, as well as the Justice Department's personality with enforcing export controls and even with OFAC and how they enforce economic sanctions laws. Um, the way that DDTC operates is they don't too often engage in enforcement matters. It's usually on average two enforcement cases a year. And to put that in perspective, they receive approximately 650 disclosures a year. Uh, about 50 of which are directed, 600 are voluntary disclosures. So out of 650 cases that come in, only uh, about two cases will see it to the end of becoming a consent agreement. And by contrast, commerce, OFAC, uh, tend to do dozens of cases a year, some of which are fairly routine enforcement uh, penalties and other cases can be a little bit bigger. Um, and part of the personality there is there's this general pride and sense within DDTC of we don't want to be too scary. Uh, we want to work with industry. It's very important that the defense trade system works because this is the legal side of the defense trade business. Um, and just working with industry to, to um, fix, correct, 
uh, 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 their compliance programs to better ensure that violations don't take place. The agency is fully aware that it's impossible to stop all the leaks. Violations will happen no matter how good your compliance program is. So they do have that perspective. And when they get a disclosure into the agency, whether it's directed or whether it's a voluntary one, um, it's a constant working with companies in a lot of situations to identify what are the deep root causes and what are the best corrective actions to take. Some companies will try to front run that effort by coming into DDTC with a disclosure and already implementing self-initiated corrective actions. Other times it's a push and pull and DDTC may um, respond to a voluntary disclosure with a directed disclosure or a directed audit or a directed combined jurisdiction request. Um, but even in those cases, and those happen dozens of times a year where you have this push and pull with significant compliance issues, uh, it's still mostly handled behind the scenes. And again, very limited number of cases actually go and become a, a consent agreement. So if it does become a consent agreement, what does that look like? And the common characteristics are that it's a oversight agreement that typically covers three, sometimes four years. Uh, typically requires a special compliance official. Typically that is an external SCO, uh, but sometimes it can be an internal or external that becomes internal. Um, and the SCO manages the consent agreement and also the interaction with DDTC. Uh, describes remedial measures and we'll discover that and we'll, we'll go through that uh, later on. Uh, imposes a penalty and we'll, we'll discuss the nuances of that later on as well. And it usually does not uh, impose debarment upon the entity as well, so that they can still proceed with ITAR transactions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on this slide and the next slide, what we've done is we presented the last 10 consent agreements and tried to extract the key factors from those consent agreements. And not in the presentation is also the factors from the last 25, 30 consent agreements, but try to basically aggregate all this, all of this data together to come up with some um, main general key trends from ITAR enforcement. There was actually a consent agreement that just came out, the first one of 2022, uh, on Monday by DDTC. Uh, we were actually trying to have this presentation front run <laughs> DDTC's announcement of its first consent agreement, uh, they decide to laugh at us and just announce it before this one and front run us, so go figure. Um, but not try to focus and have recency bias necessarily on Tory Pines or Keysight, uh, but just kind of bring it all together so that there's one thematic um, conclusions that we can draw from these, from these most recent cases. And uh, some of those um, general themes are that DDTC is taking a uh, apparently a balanced approach to ITAR enforcement. Um, Tory Pines, for instance, is a relatively small company, and that is the fourth consent agreement over, uh, out of the last 10 to focus on a relatively small company. And if you extract that out to over the last decade, so since tw uh, 2012, there have been 20 consent agreements uh, since then, and seven have been against relatively small companies. So that's a fair balance between relatively small companies like Tory Pines, um, uh, Darling, Bright Lights, or, or two other ones that are on the next slide. Um, and then more medium-sized businesses, kind of like Keysight, which I believe is slightly outside the Fortune 500. And then other companies like Honeywell, which is within the Fortune 500, I think within the Fortune 100. So it seems that DTC is trying to balance their enforcement. So so as to not give the impression that we're only focus on we're only focusing on large defense companies, major players in the defense trade field, and and medium sized players, but every company, regardless of its size, has the equal chance of uh, of getting an enforcement action against it. So I think that's one of the takeaways from this. Another one is harm to national security, and if if um, Someone has heard the government speak at various public conferences. They probably have heard harm to national security is a big concern for the government, obviously. Uh, but we're not seeing that in the data with more recent consent agreements, where only two out of the last 10 have, expl have explicitly said that there is harm to national security. And turning to the latest case with Tory Pines, there uh, DDTC said that it was unknown whether there was harm to national security. 
and they blamed it on Tory Pines' alleged uh, not maintaining and producing records as required by the ITAR, as not giving DATC sufficient data points to know whether there is harm to national security. That said, to give some additional context, um, DDTC generally finds that when SME, significant military equipment is involved, as it was in Tory Pines case, that presumes harm to national security. So DDTC could have left it at that and said, well, regardless of your record keeping, uh, SME was involved. We have a presumption of national security because you didn't have the records. Allegedly, uh, we're, you can't overcome the presumption. Um, but they didn't do that. So that kind of shows, again, that perhaps this harm to national security, while it might get uh, your disclosure when it goes into the government to go from the, we're not really perhaps too interested in this case, to the other pile, which says uh, we're going to take a further review. So while it might have that consequence, when it comes to an actual consent agreement, harm to national security hasn't been an overriding factor. Um, technical data, software is another, or two other areas, so basically intangibles. That makes sense. If you have a tank, you can have a finite number of those tanks, but the information, the software to support it can be more infinite, so more opportunities for there to be violations. Uh, also with software, software can change depending on versions and it can give more capabilities and functionality. Um, and sometimes companies aren't aware of those nuances. Uh, and then also with 126.1, uh, that's another issue that is getting more uh, of focus within DDTC, particularly with respect to China and Russia. Six out of the last 10 uh, consent agreements have focused on 126.1. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, just more, more data points here. Uh, just a quick note on Darling. Uh, Darling is a relatively small company. You'll notice there's really nothing egregious about this case. No harm to national security, no significant military equipment. There was a voluntary disclosure. Charges were only six, no 126.1. Um, and before this consent agreement came out, there's basically an unspoken rule uh, that if you had a, a non-egregious case with a relatively small company who perhaps didn't realize that there's this thing called the ITAR, then they found out about it, they disclosed and they, they corrected it, that DDTC wasn't going to proceed with a consent agreement in that situation. And a lot of practitioners understood that. And um, I, I think that there were probably way more uh, voluntary disclosures than perhaps needed to take place uh, with that fact pattern. Um, but DDTC, interestingly enough, actually uh, went for that exact fact pattern um, uh, in the Darling case. And uh, I know in speaking to other practitioners as well, uh, one of the consequences of that has been a bit of a chilling effect where now when a small company has that similar non-egregious situation and when they ask for advice of what to do, it used to be, well, we can't really point to any case where DDTC has enforced it uh, to a consent agreement and now they have something to, so now companies are figuring that into their calculus, so whether DDTC um, realized it or not, that, that can have a chilling effect. But I just want to point that out because I used to work at DDTC and when I saw that <laughs> consent agreement, and even to this day, it still surprises me that they, uh, that, that they proceeded with that. Um, but we'll discuss uh, in a little bit why that might be the case. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there's uh, a, another key trend here is a substantial penalty reduction for cooperation. And there's two points to make with this slide. Uh, the first one, I just wanna, well, not one of the points, but just to make you aware of this, uh, FLIR's numbers are going through the roof, and the reason for that is because DDTC uh, had doubled, more than doubled, uh, the penalty from 500000 to slightly over a million. So if you want to adjust that in your head, it's, it's a little bit more <laughs> closer to the other ones like Intercell and, and L3 Harris. Um, but the, the first point of this is that when DDTC has a proposed charging letter, which usually doesn't take in, into account all the violations that they could pursue. Uh, so that's, that's one nice advantage is that they're not going to uh, increase the uh, total amount of violations and therefore the maximum penalty. But nevertheless, uh, you can see that under the maximum fine that they could give you over what violations that the government's going to pursue, you see this small, much smaller number. Um, I have to squint to see it then you see the actual penalty amount that they do in a consent agreement. And it's basically taking off anywhere from 80 to 97% of what that maximum penalty is. 
And then they have a discounted penalty as well that under a consent agreement, here's your penalty, but we're going to um, reserve some of the penalty, which you can apply to remedial efforts as well. So the, the sum of this is that at the end of the day, a lot of companies have 90 to 97% reductions in what their penalties are. And uh, some companies have asked BIS, uh, Commerce, um, or, or have asked DDTC to follow what Commerce does, where they provide quadrants of, if you have a non-egregious case with a voluntary disclosure, here's the maximum penalty, and it, it's in very favorable terms and so forth. But looking at the data, DDTC is basically using its discretion um, to already basically do that and, and leave companies with very small fines at the end of the day. Uh, the other data point here is that regardless of whether you do a voluntary disclosure or a directed disclosure, again, that might get you, <laughs> not doing a voluntary disclosure might get you into a different pile if the government directs you to do the disclosure um, that can lead to a consent agreement. But when it comes to the actual penalty, there's a last ditch effort here to still provide cooperation with the government and uh, basically the, the penalties can still line up uh, where there's not really a difference between a company that was directed to disclose and, and heavily cooperated with government's investigation versus a company that voluntarily disclosed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so uh, wrapping this up, and uh, of course the obvious question that people wanna know is why a consent agreement in certain cases? Um, and this is really um, two factors that a bit overlap. The first one is when you have that disclosure come to come into the government, is there some characteristic about it that's pretty egregious, that's pretty, I don't want to say unconscionable, but something that really is going to have the regulators have some type of uh, reaction to it? So like a repeat violation, uh, items going to China with knowledge and so forth. Um, and then the other one is, with only doing two consent agreements a year, the government can only focus on so much, uh, but it can also use these consent agreements as a vehicle to, to make the uh, industry aware of an issue that they need to focus their compliance efforts on. So just as we had spent the last couple of slides trying to figure out what are the factors that motivate DDTC to get into a, a consent agreement, they do that in reverse and they look at industry and say, we have all these disclosures. What are the trends from industry with all these disclosures? Is it an issue with an empowered official? Do they not know who the right empowered official is like with what was alleged in, in the Darling case? So they can use it to basically be a vehicle to say, okay, we've seen enough of this issue, we're tired of it. So let's do a disclosure or let's do a consent agreement on this issue. And that way uh, we can communicate uh, our dis dissatisfaction with this issue to the rest of the regulated community so that they can get in line. And sometimes it's very unfair. Sometimes it's just, uh, perhaps in the case of Darling, it was just wrong place, wrong time. They, they got tired of seeing this issue and they were, they were reviewing that case at the time and it just so happens it's, it's poor timing for them. Um, so those, those can be the two uh, general ways that you can get into a, a consent agreement what DDTC is looking for. So this hook factor of basically an elevator pitch of you know, what is really uh, the, the concern egregious factor within a case. Uh, and then major trends, aggravating factors, um, systemic issues, not fixing corrective actions, especially if you said to DDTC, you would take those corrective actions, no voluntary disclosure, no cooperation, jurisdiction classification issues, repeat violations, 126.1, um, certain CJ activities too. If, if you're directed to do a CJ or submit a CJ, and you have supposedly doubt to jurisdiction and you don't treat the item as ITAR controlled and it comes back as being ITAR, that's been a recent, uh, recently aggravating circumstance. Uh, mitigation, uh, doing a voluntary disclosure, cooperation, tolling agreements, self-initiated corrective actions. Uh, if it's a licensing issue and it's not going to 126.1, that the license would have been approved uh, if you had submitted that licensing application taking responsibility and uh, showing a corporate compliance culture has changed and is focused on complying. Uh, remedial efforts, uh, it's pretty much always within this bucket of doing audits, uh, jurisdiction classification review, policies, procedures, training, um, support, uh, both legal support and uh, non-legal expertise within a company, uh, as well as automated compliance programs. Um, and I think that's it. So now we can, uh, oh, and uh, jurisdiction classification, um, 
there have been uh, five out of the last seven consent agreements have focused on jurisdiction classification reviews. And when it comes to relatively increasing chances of a consent agreement, uh, that's just more uh, doing division. In 2014, there were 1,700 disclosures going into DDTC. Again, two consent agreements, so one in an 850 chance of leading to a consent agreement. Now with only 650 disclosures, it's a one in 325 chance. And I think DDTC could up their consent agreements to an average of three. Also with COVID, uh, there have not been that many directed uh, disclosures as there have been in the past. There have been around 40 the last couple of years per year. It's usually around 50. So expect to see that increasing, especially as they go back to doing uh, the company visit program. So with that, we can turn it over. So just as we pivot to BIS and, and I turn to Tim, just one quick thought to, um, to build on what Chris just said. So obviously some of those items unique to DDTC and the tools that they have and the approach that they take. But I think just to call out to, you know, a few things that are, you're going to hear a lot more about countries of, of sort of greatest risk and greatest concern. So Chris mentioned the 126.1 countries in particular, China and Russia. I think we're going to hear a lot more about that the nature of the cooperation and in particular, whether there was a disclosure on the front end, the decision of whether to disclose and sort of how that calculus works out, what the ultimate haircut or benefit on the penalty amount is. Um, all of those things I think are, are critical considerations that we'll, we'll talk about more kind of across all, all the agencies, but just wanted to quickly flag that before we dive into BIS. So yeah, Mr. Well, thank, thank you, Brian. Um, and before I, go directly to BIS. I, I do want to kind of, um, you know, for those of you who are, who are out there thinking, why are we getting into such detail about these enforcement actions? I, I, I want to kind of tie the knot from what Chris said and what Brian will say and what I'm going to talk about with BIS. Um, and, and Chris said it, I think, a, a little bit earlier. These agencies are trying to send companies a message about what their priorities are because, you know, it, all of us see issues almost every day. And one of the things that we try to pride ourselves on is to try and separate what is a really big issue from what is a really small issue. And the agencies are, are kind of trying to tell you that when they are uh, publishing enforcement actions, because you know these enforcement actions that we see published are just a teeny handful of the, the actions that come in front of them. And so they've decided that 95, 96, 90 percent percent of the cases that are in front of them are just kind of little insignificant screw ups that we all see all the time that are just not worth putting out a message on. But there's a small number of them that they say, these are the things that we are paying attention to. And these are the things that when you're trying to figure out what's a big screw up and what's a small screw up and where do you send, where do you prioritize your compliance resources? This is where we want you to prioritize them. And so that's why it's worth digging deeply into these cases so that you can prioritize your compliance resources in the same way that the agencies are really trying to tell you to prioritize your compliance resources. And so at BIS, um, which is the agency that deals with the, the dual use goods, the goods that are not militarily controlled, but, but are on the commerce control list or, or are EA-99. Um, the, the, and so they, they, they run the export administration regulations. We have new leadership. Uh, we have Matt Axrod, who is now the Assistant Secretary for Export Enforcement. We have uh, Thea Kendler, who is now the Assistant Secretary for Export Administration. One thing that you'll see in the slides that they have in common is that they both uh, are DOJ alums. And, you know, that's important because the DOJ alums are going to come to, to, to cases both with a, a, an enforcement um, penalty kind of not bias, but that's something that they've done throughout their careers. They've seen criminal cases. I think they've got, in some sense, some of the same um, sensitivities that we have as, as, as lawyers all on this call that have, have come from enforcement backgrounds so that they're kind of used to seeing the big cases from the little ones, but they're also used to going after the big cases relatively aggressively. And you'll see that, um, you know, Ms. Kenler was, was involved in the prosecution against Huawei. Um, you know, Mr. Axelrod has already 
made public statements about how uh, export violations are going to be a priority for this administration. And so I think we're going to see more enforcement uh, in the coming three years than, than we had seen in, in maybe the previous four. Although I will say that with respect to export controls um, in particular, I, I don't think there's going to be a big change from administration to administration. And as we'll see, um, and you can see this on the next bullet, China was a priority for the Trump administration. China is a continued priority for the Biden administration. It was actually a priority, enforcement priority for the Obama administration. But we'll talk a little bit about it in a few seconds about what sorts of China priorities are out there and where you ought to prior prioritize your compliance resources with respect to China. And then the other thing that we're going to talk about, and you'll see this as a trend as we talk through some of the specific cases, is the entity list. The entity list, um, I think back when ZTE was placed on the entity list back in 2016, was something that was kind of an unknown backwater of export controls work. I think now it is probably BIS's primary target of export enforcement. And so it really, the last five years, it's been a really big change. And I think everybody on the call probably knows what the entity list, not only what it is, but they've probably had, as we have, a number of cases involving potential shipments to entity list entities and a, and a number of different um, context and, and, and a, a lot of discussions and potentially a lot of investigations with respect to entity list issues. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so I, when we're talking about the entity list, I, I think we, we do want to, you know, like BIS's general focus, uh, the entity list uh, additions have really focused on two U.S. rival countries, one being China, uh, and, and the Chinese entities, have many have been added to the list over the past five years. The focus has been on the tech sector. Again, this isn't surprising. You, the U.S. government, and it's continued from administration to administration, suggests that one big area of concern is the, is the Chinese government and potentially Chinese entities uh, attempt to steal US technology. Uh, there's also some foreign policy issues that the entity list has been used to address. So for example, um, the, there's been Chinese expansion in the South China Sea. There, has, there have been human rights abuses, uh, abuses in, in Xinjiang province. And the entity list has been used as a tool to try and put companies onto the list, make it more difficult for them to get US technology if they've been either infringing on the those foreign policy interests uh, generally or infringing upon the, the U.S. interests in safeguarding U.S. technology. Uh, and, and so, you know, you can see from the list, half the additions to the entity list or nearly half were related to China, many in the tech sector. Um, China now has the most listed parties on the entity list. And remember, you know, one of the big developments over the last three or four years has been essentially the Chinese annexation of, of Hong Kong and, and essentially Taking, taking away any real difference um, between Hong Kong and the rest of the, the Chinese state. It, it, prior to, I'd say, 2018 or so, Hong Kong had been a relatively autonomous part of China pursuant to the agreement um, in 1997 when the British returned uh, Hong Kong to Chinese control. Uh, in the last few years, that's really changed quite a bit with the adoption of the Chinese national security law. And so at this point, Hong Kong, um, as a result of that, is treated by the United States and by other countries now as part of China. And so the export restrictions that apply to China are now the same restrictions that apply to Hong Kong. And in the same way, the Hong Kong entity list has grown over the last few years. Given the events in the news, um, the relationship with Russia has deteriorated uh, quite a bit over the last few years. Um, and that's also resulted in an increase in Russian entities, um, particularly entities affiliated with Russia's WMD, Chemical Biological Weapons Program. You can imagine kind of where those restrictions came from. And so Russia has a number of parties on the list. Uh, you'll also see a number of entities in the, in the UAE, Pakistan, and Iran. Um, I would say that many of the entities that are on the list in the UAE probably have some relationship to the, the, the not necessarily entities in Iran, but uh, transshipments to Iran because uh, Dubai in particular is pretty relatively well known as a transshipment hub and the entity list has been used um, as a tool to try and stop that to some extent with respect to UAE. 
Pakistan is a bit unusual, but the, the, the entities on the Pakistani list are, are largely related to the Pakistan nuclear program. Um, and, and many of them are, are in some sense historic in nature, although the entity list listings continue. So if, you're, if you've got um, customers or potential uh, business in Pakistan, there is a, a high presence of the, on the entity list there. Before we flip to the next one, just one, one thought on this, which is you know, for those of you out there who were familiar with the entity list in the pre-ZTE era, let's call it, as Tim kind of delineated it, um, and certainly during my time in government, the, the, the practice and approach was the, you know, the entities that were nominated to be put on the list that were put before the end user review committee, there would typically be a, a pretty clear and demonstrated disregard for US export control regulations and, a, and perhaps a demonstrated history of violations that would get that entity put on the list. Now, the entity list has really been flipped on its head and weaponized in a way that just didn't, wasn't the case five years ago. And we saw this obviously starting under the Trump administration where kind of broad, uh, you know, determinations of entities acting contrary to U.S. national security and foreign policy interests was enough to get a, to get somebody put on the list, um, especially with regard to China and with regard to anything having to do with the civil military fusion uh, mandate of the Chinese uh, government. And so I think that has had the effect of making this a much more powerful tool. Obviously, it has also, I think, had a, had the effect for those of us in who are advisors and who are in compliance roles, I get this question, I know Tim gets this question, help me understand whether this end user, this customer, this supply chain partner might be might be in the mix to be put on the entity list in the future. Yep. It is a very difficult thing to assess these days, given the broad criteria that are being used to put, to put new entities on the list. So I think that's one complicating factor that we all now live with and some of the enforcement actions that we look at, which largely predate that trend, but I think they are sort of indicative of what we may be seeing coming forward with entity list related enforcement actions, I think is something just to, to keep an eye on. Yeah, I, I think, you know, to, to maybe coin a term on this, it's it's kind of like the ofacization, if there is such a term, of the entity list because it, the long it does- arm, The long arm of the entity list. Yeah, yeah. It, it does look a lot more like some of the OFAC lists now and the, the policy basis for the list and that listing and, and kind of the, in some ways, not really that closely related to export controls in a way that just Pre, pre ZTE, that the entity list was, you know, in the EAR in part because it was an export controls tool and almost exclusively one. Now, it, it, you know, it still is it, its main um, policing function or the main teeth of the entity te teeth that the entity list has is that you know it regulates export controls, but it's not necessarily used because of past export controls violations, and actually not often used because of that reason anymore. It's much more foreign policy based, um, you know, for the reason for uh, for the types of things that we, we we've been talking about: human rights abuses, um, you know, using it for cyber issues, using it for operations in the South China Sea, which doesn't have anything to do with export controls, but has a lot to do with U.S. interests. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is this is another um, expansion of one of the provisions of the, the EAR in the last few years that's been largely directed towards China, although also directed towards towards Russia and a few other countries. But it's the expansion of the military end users rule. And so in um, in the EAR 744.21 uh, has a rule that uh, has special licensing requirements that apply to military end users or if the product's gonna, gonna have military end uses. And in uh, June of 2020, BIS uh, expanded the reach of that rule to military end users in China. The reason this, this was important is that the definition of military end users is both extremely broad and very ambiguous. And so it really has created a, 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 a it, when you combine it with the Chinese um, expansion of kind of military civil fusion, it's created real confusion about when you would need a license to send things to China because many entities in China arguably would fall within this catch all definition of um, military end users. Because of that breadth, um, and to try and give some clarity to who is a military end user, uh, in the last uh, in the last year, uh, BIS amended 744.21 to exp 
to, to add this military end user list to at least try and tell you who is in fact a military end user. Now it's not an exclusive list, which doesn't, which means that even if you you'd find that the company that you're dealing with is not on the list, you still have to do the calculus under this really vague provision of, of 744.21, I think it's G. Um, but but that said, there is this military end users list in, in supplement seven to, to part 744. And lo and behold, when you look at the list, you know, 71 of the 115 entities are in China and 44 are in Russia. And so we're back to kind of the use of export controls with respect to China and Russia in a way um, that is really focused in, in part on export controls, but really also in, it focused on, on national security in a, in a more broad way. Uh, the, the, there are other countries that have now been added to the military end user list. I think Burma is the one, um, you know, Burma, Myanmar is the one to watch out for the most because now that the, the Burmese military is in control of the country, when you look at that in con conjunction with the, the broad catch-all definition of military end user, I think in Burma, it's very hard to tell who a military end user is and, and who isn't. And I think there'll be a lot of companies that have enough connections to the Burmese military or to the Burmese government, which have now become the same thing, that, that if you're doing business in, in that country as well, I think the MEU list is, is something that to, to focus on. Remember that this doesn't apply to all uh, exports. So for example, um, EAR 99 goods are not covered by the military end user rule, not covered by the military end uses rule. There, there might be some restrictions in other parts of the EAR if it's an EAR 99 good, but but these rules do apply. If, the, if you've got an item that's on the, the list it's and there's a supplement to part 744 that contains the list of EC CCNs that are subject to this restriction, uh, it could be it, it could be problematic. And, and then also keep in mind that because of the the fusion between Hong Kong and China over the last few years, Hong Kong is now subject to this list as well. So let's go to the next slide. All right, and so so. What we're going to do now that we've kind of set the backdrop is we're going to run quickly through a few enforcement actions that, that really demonstrate some of these trends. And the first one we're going to talk about is Dy Dynatex International, which is a, a, just a, a recent enforcement action from August of 2021. And so in Dynatex, we had a U.S. manufacturer um, that was exporting EAR so EAR-99 um, semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Now remember, semiconductor manufacturing equipment should be familiar to many of you because it's really the focus of a lot of the, the restrictions as to Huawei. And so when you see that, you start to think potentially problematic. And then it looks like Dynatex, um, at least from the reported documents, had a number of red flags. Um, they they were uh, it, the company was apparently informed that uh, this company that there was their their potential customer was on the was on a blacklist. Um, it 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 responded that it didn't need to pay any attention to that because that wasn't its customer. That it was the customer of the distributor. So essentially, that we're just selling to the distributor and this is the end user, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but then they were also told to take the company's name off the shipping documents so as not to flag anything and um and and later understand that it did understand the licensing requirement applied to to these sorts of goods which is also problematic because when you go to the entity list it actually tells you the goods that the uh, entity listing applies to and it you know here it listed eAR 99 goods so so it wasn't much of an explanation so at that point um, you know they were hit with a, a $469,000 civil penalty. Um, the penalty is not huge, but but huge enough. Um, and it wasn't a it was you know not bigger, but because there wasn't you look at the value of the goods and the value of the goods in this transaction wasn't that high. And so, but but there were a number of things that you would want to take away from this. But the main one is that when you see red flags like this, you really have to get someone involved who knows how to deal with the entity list. I will add that there is a little bit of confusion uh, with respect to the role that the entity list entity played. Um, it, it, and, and that might not have been too unreasonable because the entity list was amended recently to make clear that it, any role played by an entity list entity in the transaction is including as pay or obviously the end user um, could could it triggers the entity list restrictions. Um, so the confusion 
is possible at the margins, at least before the amendment to the to the reg. But at this point, um, you know, if you've got an end user that's on the entity list, you've got to be more careful than than Dynatex apparently was here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, we'll also talk a little bit very quickly about Avnet. I think that that's if this is another uh, shipment. It's to a, an entity list entity in Hong Kong. I think that the takeaway here is that the shipment was to a customer of Avnet that was not listed at the time they became the customer. They became list, listed after um, the after the the first sale. So it was later sales. They went on the entity list. Um, the compliance software flagged the the issue. Um, but but the the fact is is that they re, re ran the transaction through the system and there was no hit and so there was some confusion about whether at least at, at Avnet according to the documents about whether or not um, the 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 company was on the entity list and the confusion was re resolved in favor of shipping and I think the message here is once you kind of get this sort of red flag that you're dealing potentially dealing with an entity list entity you've got to be very very careful and run this issue to ground um and and here there were 53 violations of the eAR and that resulted in a 3.2 million dollar penalty but i think the importance of rescreening um after the original customer onboarding and then uh you know once you see a potential sign of an entity list entity, you've got to think very clearly about should we do this? Uh, because once you make that decision to do it once, often you do it more than once. And here it happened, um, you know, a, a number of, of different times and resulted in a pretty significant penalty. Let's go to the next slide. And then uh, SP Industries, we wanted to include this on here because you know, Huawei has been in the news quite a bit for when it, it got put on the entity list as well and has a number of unusual entity list restrictions. The penalty itself, $80,000 is, is not huge. And I think that is a result of the, the VSD that was done in, in, this, in this case. But um, because of errors in the export screening process, SP Industries allowed a number of shipments to go to, of EAR99 items, but everything to Huawei requires a license at this point. Uh, those items were shipped to Huawei uh, without a license. Uh, they got through the, the screening process. At, at some point, SP realized that they had made this mistake, disclosed themselves. I think BI, BIS issued this penalty, uh, which was relatively small compared to what it could have been, mostly so that it could also at the same time send a message that it was watching what was happening with Huawei very closely and any Huawei related issues were going to be dealt with very severely. So let's go to the next slide. And then finally, um, we wanted to give one instance of the, the enforcement of the the MEU rules, and this was involving a Russian company, even though I have to say the bulk of the MEU issues, at least in my experience, involved China. But this was a Russian company, um, the Federal Guard Service, and we had a shipment of uh, ECCN 8A992 uh, maritime jet boots that were um, transferred to FSO or that were sent to FSO um, uh, at, at, at uh, without a license, and it required a license in part, not because FSO was on the MEU list, but because it met the MEU definition. Now, I will say that um, the, F, the, the Federal Guard Service, FSO, um, it was a pretty easy catch in terms of the military end users list because it falls within the, the non-catch-all definition. So the military end, the definition of military end users um, starts with the National Armed Services, the National Guard, and the National Police. And that's pretty easy to apply, and they fell within that here. So this was not an action about the catch-all definition that basically says that anyone else who performs, performs military end uses, which is much diff more difficult uh, uh, to, to analyze. So this was one of the easy ones that slipped through. Um, you know, they were supposedly on notice of this, although, you know, the notifications were not all that great, but they, they at least had noticed that there, that in the federal register, there was this military end user rule and they didn't comply with it. And so they got a civil penalty of $200,000. But I think these are good examples of what BIS is focusing on currently. And so if you have issues in those areas, you're going to have to pay a special attention to those. And, you know, obviously you want to pay attention to everything, but when you're 
deciding where to put your compliance resources. I think if you're dealing with Russia or China, the MEU it, it, compliance with 7, 744.21 is really important. And then anytime you see anything that approaches an entity list entity involved in the transaction in any way, um, you've got to look closely at it because you know the BIS is going to look closely at it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Yeah, just one final, you can move the slide forward. Um, we Just one final thought on that. I mean, obviously, and again, sort of picking back up on where Chris started with DDTC, I think sort of core, you know, jurisdiction classification issues relating to the proper administration of your company's export um, program are always going to be important and are always going to be a point of emphasis for all for DDTC and BIS. I think we wanted to highlight, though, again, entity list issues and MEU issues, because I think in our experience in the last couple of years, those are the things that we tend to get the most calls about. We tend to have the most concerned clients that are worried about getting that stuff right, because it is trickier. There are a lot of gray areas when it comes to identifying who those people are and what the requirements might be, whether licenses are required uh, and what have you. So we wanted to, to sort of flag that because anecdotally, I think that's what, where, what we see as being um, perhaps having seen an uptick in terms of interest and enforcement, um, both in industry and uh, at the agency. Uh, so with that, let me spend the last 15 minutes or so going through an overview of what DOJ has been up to and is likely to be up to here in the next few years uh, on the export control enforcement front. So for those who are unfamiliar, the, the unit within DOJ that oversees and uh, ultimately approves all criminal charges in the export control space is my old unit, uh, Counterintelligence and Export Control Section, CES, within the National Security Division. There have been, not surprisingly, many, many uh, criminal cases that have involved allegedly willful violations of the ITAR and the AAR uh, over the last several years. This is, I would say, uh, especially with respect to China and Iran, uh, this, I would say, is pretty indicative of what we have seen um, over the last decade plus with respect to criminal export control enforcement. There was always going to be, I think, just like I said, with kind of jurisdiction classification issues and ensuring that companies are getting that right. I think there are always going to be a certain level of enforcement that we're going to be seeing on the criminal side. Um, that's I don't want to um, sort of... Uh, sort of give it short shrift, but that's a little more run of the mill. That's, you know, sort of typical uh, one individual or a company who's trying to, um, you know, play fast and loose and disregard the rules to their advantage. So we, we have seen that and that has been constant. I think we have seen an uptick, frankly, in the broader multi-agency actions. And we'll talk a bit more about a few of those uh, in a moment. I also think that um, for those who are following this, um, DOJ's China initiative, um, much maligned of late, has been in the news in part because of a very high profile uh, dismissal of a case against a professor at MIT relating to activities that he was allegedly involved in that have nothing to do with export controls. I, I think there is about to be a shift away from those types of cases and enforcement focus at DOJ. They have essentially acknowledged as much without tr without officially acknowledging it. And I think into that void will come more traditional export enforcement, especially focused on China, Russia, and Iran. And I, and I think it's, it's astonishing for those who were following this at the time it was announced when this was originally, the China initiative was originally announced back in 2018 when Jeff Sessions was still attorney general. And if you look at the bullet points of the points of emphasis that are on there, it is mostly focused on um, economic espionage, trade secret theft, non-traditional intelligence collectors, uh, you know, supply chain security and the like, export controls is not even mentioned <laughs> in there. Implicit within some of those is export control enforcement, but it's not even mentioned. So that's, that's a fairly astonishing, and I, I don't think I'd even remembered that until I went back and looked at it recently. But I do think that that, is, that has always been a focus. It was a focus when I was there. It is still a focus now. I think it is going to be an even bigger focus under the current regime at the Justice Department. So that is, I think, a reason to be keeping a close watch on what DOJ is doing in terms of uh, investigating and prosecuting cases in this space. Uh, related to that as well is, I think, the uh, department-wide and government-wide focus on combating 
um, malicious cyber activity and ransomware attacks, which has is a stated um, focus of the Justice Department. And if you look at the people who are at the top of the pyramid at the Justice Department, Lisa Monaco, John Carlin in the, De in the Deputy Attorney General's office, Matt Olson, who's now the new Assistant Attorney General over National Security Division, they all have a very strong background in cyber and in uh, cyber law enforcement matters. And so it is a natural kind of fit that they would be the people kind of leading the charge on this. And I think that as we'll get into in a minute, and as people who are following this know, there's kind of a natural um, synergy and overlap between a lot of the malicious cyber activity that we see and um, export control uh, enforcement. And, uh, you know, when there's computer fraud and abuse act charges, there may very well be um, ITAR controlled technical data that's being, um, you know, uh, exfiltrated from a company systems as, as some, some of you know all too well. So these are things that I think are natural companions. And so I think as a result of that, we're gonna see even more emphasis in this space going forward. Another thing to, to keep in mind is, and one thing that obviously Chris spent a lot of time talking about um, the consent agreements and sort of the disclosure issues that DDTC factors in. Um, and I think the uh, not to be um, understated is the fact that D the National Security Division still has a relatively new voluntary self-disclosure policy. It's just over two years old. The current policy was rolled out in December, 2019. The only case so far to come to conclusion where a company has gotten credit under that new program is the SAP case, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, and, and I think that was an effort to align NSD's policy with what the fraud section was doing or with other elements of DOJ are doing in terms of what a voluntary disclosure really is, what cooperation means, and what kind of remediation is going to be expected of you in order to get the the concrete benefits in the form of potentially a non-prosecution agreement and a big uh, discount in terms of the money that you will have to fork over, uh, perhaps not even a penalty, just disgorgement or forfeiture, uh, if you sort of jump through all the hoops that are required of you there. So that ends up being, I think, the most interesting and complicated question for me in most of these cases, which is that threshold of, well, do we disclose? What do we need to factor in? What do we need to do in order to make an intelligent decision about whether we do that? We'll talk about that a, a bit more in a few minutes with a couple of the cases that have come down recently. And I think also to, to bear in mind is the idea that in recent years, the trend has not been away, has not been toward companies are forced to take guilty pleas in order to get um, these cases resolved. They have been able to get them resolved through NPAs and DPAs. Is that about to change? Um, and also no monitorships. Since since ZT, I don't believe there has been a, a, a monitorship on the DOJ side um, in the export control and sanction space. Is that about to change? Is the, is the department currently looking for, uh, perhaps with Huawei, a situation where they can make an example of a company and they can really impose some uh, pretty onerous uh, requirements to, to have them resolve a, a, a big criminal case? So we, we shall see. Um, we can go forward. And, and again, just to echo and to reiterate a few of the things I just said. So John Carlin, who's the number two in the, in the Deputy Attorney General's office and former head of the National Security Division, um, made a comment in the fall that sort of touted the robust pipeline of cases that DOJ has in this area and uh, sort of signaled to everybody that more enforcement is coming and, and be ready for that. And I, I think all signals are certainly pointing toward and in our experience, thus far a year into the Biden administration, everything uh, certainly seems to be supporting that. And we can move forward. So again, wanna run through, we can advance the slide to the next one. We wanna run through a couple of examples here quickly and then reserve just a couple minutes for some cross-cutting issues. So the two that I really wanna talk about are SAP and Airbus, which are two of the biggest uh, matters that have come out um, on the criminal side in recent years. So with SAP, as I alluded to earlier, a couple of things here. I think this is a, and DOJ has held this up as a prime example of when a company has gained significant benefit in terms of the resolution and the penalty or lack thereof that a company has had to um, pay in order to resolve um, a very complex, and in this case, um, multi-year series of violations that numbered in the thousands 
And if you were to calculate the sheer amount of penalty that could have been on the line here, I, I don't even know that I've seen that number, but it would be astronomical. And what SAP did instead was they realized, and, and again, for those who are unfamiliar, there were kind of a couple of different strands of violations, some of which were relating to most, or both I think are fair to say were relating to the fact that SAP just did not have um, appropriate internal controls uh, within their compliance program to kind of recognize what services and goods were being provided to Iran or um, from the U.S. to the benefit, uh, serving the benefit of those in Iran. Um, and so there were obviously some pretty significant um, remedial measures that were demanded of them. And they touted the fact in the uh, resolution that the company expended something close to $30 million in remediating these issues over the course of time as they were in the midst of investigating and cooperating with DOJ. Um, as a result, the penalty that they ultimately paid um, sort of pales in comparison to what they paid out of pocket to remediate all of that. Um, DOJ, as I said, has held this case up as number one, the first case of a company gaining the benefit under the new VSD policy, and also a prime example of um, the benefit that can be gained when you sort of assess your situation, you assess your facts, you have done a thorough investigation. The, the lawyers who conducted this um, investigation and who ran this case um, certainly know what they're doing on the investigative side of things. And that is almost always a precursor to be to making intelligent decisions when you're looking at this type of complexity and this scope of conduct that's at issue. Um, and so, so there um, it is held up, I think, as an exemplar of a case where um, the company played this just right, quite frankly. Um, and DOJ gets the benefit of being able to tout this kind of success from their standpoint. Um, obviously, multiple agencies involved here, BIS and OFAC as well, were part of this resolution. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the, and there's, a, there is actually a pretty interesting audit requirement that was imposed by commerce here, but no monitorship by DOJ. So, um, again, I think no way to qualify this as anything other than a wild success for the company and trying to dig their way out of a very, um, sticky situation here. Um, next slide. Re Tim, real go real quick, go yeah, just to chime in very quickly, I, I do think that anybody that is working in the tech industry should view that enforcement action as a wake up call and SAP, as you said, Brian, played it exactly right. But there are a lot of companies, in my view, that are vulnerable to some of the issues that uh, SAP got caught up in with respect to not understanding the export implications of cloud-based services. And so to the extent those companies come after in the enforcement chain, they're not going to be treated as nicely as SAP was. Yeah, agree with that completely. Um, I, will, I will spend two minutes here on, on Airbus and let Tim chime in as well, since this is a topic that he and I have discussed uh, at length over time. Uh, including with some some folks in France and and at Airbus, but um, this is obviously I think more known as an FCPA resolution, which of course cut across the UK, France, and the US. Um, and in in some ways that is true. However, I think one big takeaway here, two or two takeaways I want to highlight. Again, another example of a company that came into NSD and got the benefit of uh, disclosure credit and cooperation credit. And this was under the old policy, the 2016 policy, the, the precursor to the current policy um, that was in place. And this is, to, to my knowledge, the first of those, um, a first kind of big resolution that uh, resulted in uh, affirmative benefit under that old policy. But I think a big takeaway here is the idea that um, when you're dealing in some of these larger, complex, multinational fraud investigations, um, of a defense contractor and of a, of a company that is selling to uh, foreign governments and to the armed services of the foreign governments, um, these ITAR Part 130 issues are almost bound to be uh, ri along for the ride, so to speak, as a result of that. And I think this is a great illustration of um, how that um, plays out and, and um, our understanding of how the investigation developed is the fraud was kind of the inciting event. And I think along the way, they later uncovered these issues as well when they realized that there were many different communications and authorizations sought from DDTC where these payments were not being disclosed. Uh, and as a result, they likely had a, a, you know, a large number of these part 130 um, 
uh, disclosure violations on their hands. And so, um, you know, again, interesting to think of in terms of what the now the awareness at DOJ and more broadly in the enforcement community and the government is to how these issues can kind of marry up and overlap to some degree, um, number one. And number two, um, just a, a, I think to circle back to where we started when, when Chris covered his, um, his piece of the talk, you know, for defense contractors and those in the um, in, in that space, I think just a just another level of complexity to kind of bear in mind as you are as you're sorting through and sifting through these issues to the extent that you're starting to dig in and investigate on some of these issues, even if it may appear to be more geared toward a traditional fraud corruption issue. Um, these this issue in particular, which can really multiply and um, you know grow on its own to be quite significant as it did here is something that is almost certainly worthy of your time to dig into as well. Yeah, I, I really do think that you know DOJ and particularly the fraud section after the Airbus prosecution is very sensitized to the idea that if they're investigating investigating a, a defense contractor for FCPA issues, that ITAR issues are under Part 130 are almost certain to be part of that. And so, um, you know, in this, I think at the time of the investigation, Airbus caught its own issues and, and self-reported them to, to DDTC, which I think mitigated the penalty somewhat, at least for the, the ITAR Part 130 violations. I, my guess is that if if you don't catch those issues yourself this next time um, and you're involved in an FCPA investigation as a defense contractor, DOJ will catch them for you and and you won't get the benefit of a self-disclosure. And so you really do need to think, if you think FCPA, you should be also thinking ITAR Part 130 as a, as a defense contractor at this point. Um, we're, we're just about out of time. I know we're at our hour. So if, if we could skip ahead to slide 24. Um, and we've already kind of covered a few of these things along the way in terms of um, some of the complexity that comes along with multi-agency disclosures and multi-agency investigations and enforcement actions. But I wanna pause just for a minute to give, um, Chris, if you wanna chime in just briefly on uh, maybe the, the first two items here, which we haven't really talked about and, and we, can, we can close on that. Uh, sure, uh, something that's becoming more popular now with BIS and DETC is, directing commodity jurisdiction or commodity commodity classification requests. Uh, so they're taking more a, of a look at items either through uh, various sources or just uh, people at DDTC and BIS are looking on the internet of items that they think should be controlled in a certain way that do not appear to be um, controlled by the company in a particular way. Um, so they're directing more and more companies to do directed CJ, directed CCATS requests. Uh, and that can be a very difficult situation to deal with because the government more or less has um, a certain view of the item already. So uh, approaching those situations and realizing that they need a little bit more care. Uh, of course, any CJ or CCATS re uh, request should have great care, uh, but even more so that the government probably has a little bit of a presumption that the item should be controlled at a higher or the highest levels. Um, so that's something to consider as well as directed disclosures that uh, the government has certain information that they're coming to a company um, and they're trying to find out additional information of how best to deal with that situation, uh, realizing that the government's usually not very happy when they have to direct a disclosure and part of the response should uh, incorporate uh, a government affairs, government relationship approach of trying to smooth over um, any bad optics that the directed disclosure might have with the government not being happy for something not being disclosed, so. All right, uh, with that, we can go to the last slide. Um, so we're, we're at five minutes past the hour. I realized that we ran just a, a tiny bit long, um, but thank you to everybody for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, and in the event that anyone has specific questions about anything that we covered today or perhaps didn't cover today, obviously, please feel free to reach out. This, is, um, this has been fun. We're also gonna make the recording of this and uh, the slides available to everybody who attended today. So, so thank you to everybody and um, thanks for showing up and we appreciate it and have a good day.